Good morning, everyone. We promised we would start at 11 sharp and we want to keep our word. So um, I will just start by saying that, um, you know, we welcome all of you today. I know it was uh, not easy, especially with the rain, usually that um, impacts uh, the attendance to an event. Um, just a few words because I know that the shortest presentations and introductions are the best, so I, I do not plan to um, keep you long. I would just say that it's great to be again um, and organize in-person events um, and that, let's say, our topic is about energy transition, decarbonization policies in Southeast Europe. But we have been talking about energy transition since 2018, 2019 in the region. And um, so not for that long, yet in this short amount of time, so much has happened, especially in the past uh, four years. We have had a pandemic, which impacted the energy markets. We have had uh, um, a war, we're still in the middle of it, um, which again has impacted significantly the energy markets. So there are so many things that have happened in the realm of energy policy and energy markets. It's so packed. Of course, we will not be able to talk about everything that has happened in these four, four years, um, but that's why we have designed today's event with like a large spectrum topic in mind, so we can touch upon um, the most important things. And we have structured uh, this event in three panels. The first panel uh, is about the regional overview, the view from Brussels, the view from uh, the Romanian ministry. Um, the second panel is about the newer topics, the cutting edge technologies and policies, and we left uh, the legacy topics and the problems that we still have to solve had uh, to be discussed in the, in the third panel. So without further ado, uh, I would invite um, Mara Roman from the European Commission, who is our host, uh, who is the host of our event today, and then later Kostis Stambolis, um, our partner with whom we put together this event to join me with a word of welcome. Um, and I hope you enjoyed what we prepared for you today. Welcome everybody and good morning. I'm really happy to, to host you here in the premises of the European uh, Commission representation in Romania. I am Mara Roman. I am the deputy head of representation. I am uh, in charge of the energy and uh, green deal portfolio in general in the rep. So it's my pleasure to, to be with you today. I would just like to say hello again and welcome, uh, congratulate the organizers. The, uh, it's the fourth. <laughs> the Romania Energy Center and the Institute of Energy for Southeast Europe for putting together such an ambitious event. As Eugenia was saying, you will touch upon a lot of topics today, um, starting from decarbonization, so moving away from coal through renewables, energy efficiency, nuclear, clean tech, so it's quite a wide spectrum that you are covering. And um, all of these topics are very, uh, very topical at EU level today, and especially in Southeastern Europe, where um, the green energy transition has, has all these topics at heart. And um, I think they are especially relevant for countries in Southeastern Europe, because these countries have specific legacies, specific energy mixes, vulnerabilities, but also opportunities they bring to the table. So just to set the event, the stage a bit, I will um, quickly go through the state of play on the energy transition at European level and then leave the in-depth discussion to, to, to you experts. Um, the EU and the member states, as you all know, have committed to achieving the net zero um, carbon, net zero greenhouse gas emission target by 2050 as part of our commitment to the Paris Agreement of 2015. It is a very ambitious target, which makes the European Union a front runner, a front runner globally. And it is an ambition that is set in law. So all member states, as the European Union as, on, as a whole, need to comply with this target. Achieving carbon neutrality is the long-term goal under the umbrella of the Green Deal, which is one of the key priorities of the European Commission. Yet we also want a just and affordable transition, where citizens have access to energy, where our industries remain competitive, innovative and future-proof, where they create new jobs and encourage new skills. 
where we all have reliable supply chains and energy security. And the Green Deal encompasses all of these elements. And it has shown, as Eugenia has also mentioned, its timeliness and resilience in fa facing all these crises we've gone through in the past year. So from COVID, uh, where recovery is based on fostering the green transition, then the war in Ukraine, where we responded with the Power EU, the energy crisis, where we had immediate emergency measures, supporting also the vulnerable, supporting the industry, and then all the economic fallout that came with it. And achieving all the objectives that I mentioned, so having the green transition, but also a socially fair one, competitiveness, new jobs, new skills, it, I think it might sound as, you know, we are trying to, to, to square the circle. And it is indeed quite, quite a challenge. But we think it needs, as prerequisite, coherent action across several policy sectors, credible planning, public and private investment, as well as social and political commitment. Where we are now, we have at European level very clear targets for 2030 and for 2050. So we know exactly where we want to be by that time. And the Fit for 55 package, I'm sure you, you all heard about it and you know it, it was adopted uh, throughout last year. And it, with the package, we have now the regulatory framework in place. And it is a framework that also takes into account the significant shift in European energy policy that was decided following the war in Ukraine, namely to relinquish the long-standing dependency on Russian fossil fuels. And you will hear more about it in my colleagues from presentation on Repower EU. Um, he will chip in from Brussels, I understand. For 2040, which is the intermediary step to 2050, the Commission has presented a communication in early February. And there we suggest setting a 90% emission reduction goal by 2040, because we think this gives a clear sense of direction to citizens, to businesses, to industry, to investors, and to governments. It allows them to take better informed decisions in the coming years as to the key reforms adaptations and investments that are needed so we can reach climate neutrality by 2050. What we have to do now is to implement what we have, the regulatory framework, and to deliver results on the ground. We think that this is a key enabler on our path to 2040 and to 2050. We also need to encourage public and private investment and I'm sure you have seen various numbers um, related to the cost of the green transition. I think they vary depending on, on the scope and specific um, proposal that they are related to. What I have as a number here that just shows us the magnitude of the challenge is that we would need an additional 477 billion euro a year additionally to deliver on the transition. And this looking at the time frame 2021-2030. At the same time, we also want to increase our capacity in key growth sectors that we can develop more here in Europe, such as batteries, electric vehicles, PVs, or CCUS technologies. And for this, medium and long-term planning has a key role to play if we want to get there coherently and cost-efficiently. And for this, we have the National Energy and Climate Plans. I'm sure you have heard about them. It's the plans where member states need to put together, put together their vision, their estimated costs, and their contributions to the European targets. They put them together in a plan that has a span of 10 years. And this year, member states are supposed to deliver the updated National Energy and Climate Plans by June. So having solid plans Giving certainty to investors is, is of key importance in, in the coming months. Also, NECPs are relevant for regional cooperation because we speak about Southeastern Europe today. And regional cooperation is one aspect in the plan that needs to be covered distinctively. And I think this is an opportunity for countries in this region, for member states in this region, to, to coordinate and to harness economies of scale and to spend money more efficiently as they move ahead on their own transition path. 
and because we talked a lot about our investments, a very last word about funds. Because the green transition is a key beneficiary of European funds. We have on the one hand the recovery and resilience facility and the Repower EU chapter, the famous PNRR in Romania, which has a climate tagging of 40%. We also have across the board uh, on the EU budget a climate, climate mainstreaming of 30%, which means that one in every three euros at European level needs to go to projects that deliver on the green transition. The Commission has also made the state aid framework more flexible, also already in post-COVID, to support industry that faces the challenges of transition. Then we have the Modernization Fund, which is linked to the climate policies, to ETS, and is available to member states to modernize their energy systems, which is, I think, particularly relevant in Southeastern Europe. Finally, we have the CEF, the Connecting Europe facility, which invests in networks, and it's important that we spend money on grid, on electricity grid, if we want to have an electrified energy system. And last but not least, EU financial institutions can provide support to new technologies, also in the nuclear field. All these funds are here to support member states, notably in southeastern Europe, with reforming and modernizing their energy production, invest in energy efficiency, and include new and clean technologies. So as I mentioned before, I think the next months and years will be crucial for member states in pursuing their transition path. At the European level, also a global level, I think, we cannot afford any backtrack because we see the IPCC reports, we see that climate change is happening even more faster in Europe than in other regions. So with this, without any other word, I give it back to you. And I wish you all very fruitful discussions today. Thank you. Thank you, Amara, for your uh, introductory remarks and for helping us you know, organize today's event. Uh, next, Costas, if you would like to. Thank you, Eugenia. And uh, thank you, Ms. Roman, for your very interesting <clears throat> introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure being uh, back to Bucharest once again. Um, this is not the first time, and I hope not the last time, that we're organizing events jointly with ROIC, Romania Energy Center. We have uh, partnered over the last 10 years, uh, participating in each other's events and conferences, but also, most importantly, in various publications and research projects. Um, our institute is, um, was established about 20 years ago, 2003, so we're relatively young and uh, restless to a certain extent. Uh, we're always reaching out for cooperation and new challenges. And of course, organizing the event today is a challenge because things are moving, um, the subjects in focus are evolving, and always we have to find the right approach so that our contribution could be of interest to uh, the community to whom we are addressing this. So hopefully the program that has been put together, as Eugenia said, um, is interesting, covers a lot of ground. Not all of it, of course, uh, but we think we have managed to put the main uh, points of interest together under one roof and in one day. And of course, we thank the European community and the offices here in uh, Bucharest for hosting this event. And this is not the first time that we were here back in October 2019, before COVID. So, um, where we are um, uh, touching base again, as they say, after many years. Now, we as an institute have um, branched out in different parts of Southeast Europe. Uh, we work with partners in all different countries, from West Balkans, the East, Turkey, Israel, Cyprus, etc. So we comprise about 15 countries, which we track from a statistical point of view, but also from a political and economic analysis. 
This has enabled us to adopt a regional view. And we think a regional view is important. Um, not that there is a lot of cohesion between um, uh, countries, uh, but it enables us to identify the trends much better, uh, to identify the problem areas, and to identify the solutions. So in that respect, we have West Balkans, we have the EU country members, and we have Turkey. So these are the three uh, areas, geographical areas and political areas, which uh, comprise uh, our work. <laughs> this has enabled us to produce what we call the Southeast Europe Energy Outlook. The last one came in 2022, the next one is 2025, and we're already working on this. Uh, and this is a kind of atlas of, of the region. But in between, we carry out a lot of other interesting projects and we work closely with the Royal Congress. Now, decarbonization definitely is the subject area of our times because it, it, we're undergoing a, a huge trans, trans, transition in, the terms of, in terms of the energy uh, fuels that we have been working, going from traditional fuels to the modern fuels or the old ones, if we call it, if we, uh, consider renewables because renewables were the first fuels. So this cha changeover has very important economic and political implications and social implications, as we all know. Abandoning coal, abandoning moving away from oil, eventually leaving gas, all this has in very important economic implications. Now, what is that decarbonization? It's not only renewables, it's a, it's a, lot, a lot many other things. It's um, nuclear, it's energy efficiency, electricity grids, new forms of renewables like white hydrogen that is available from the earth, hydrogen, um, geothermal, which is a resource uh, undervalued quite a lot, and I think it's going to play a very important role in the future. And what does this mean in terms of investment? Uh, we see here the change over time to move away from uh, uh, inter internal combustion engines to uh, electromobility. This presents definite uh, economic challenges because of the cost. And um, how is this going to affect the, the overall change? You know, this, this, these are certain issues. And there are issues for our part of the world uh, which um, is still developing. I mean, if in, in comparison to other parts of Europe, Southeast Europe, for example, has higher economic development indicators than the more mature economies in the North part. So there, there are certain um, uh, characteristics in the region which differentiate it from other parts of Europe. I won't say more, just to outline the issue of energy security, because what has really emerged over the last few years, especially since Russia's invasion to Ukraine, is the energy security dimension. And we see how the energy security dimension is uh, really appending the whole concept of a smooth energy transition. There's not going to be, a, I mean, at least this is what our analysis shows, there's not going to be a smooth energy transition is going to be a difficult energy transition. And during this difficult period, perhaps new decisions uh, and new targets will have to be set. I won't say more. I think we can go to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, Kostis. With this, we are, I mean, the part with the welcoming remarks is over. And I would invite the moderator of panel one and the speakers in panel one to join. Our panelists, uh, I would like to make uh, a very short introduction by raising two points. One refers to the South uh, East Europe region, 
as an energy status and the other to the European Central Energy Strategy for the transition itself. The key issues that confront the region's energy sector are the relatively high dependence of the majority of the countries on soil fuels, the high dependence on imported oil and gas, the lack of adequate gas supply routes and intercon interconnections. And the last, the slower than, than anticipated penetration of renewables and slow progress on energy efficiency improvement. The large amounts of indigenous coal and ignite deposits provide relatively cheap energy for most countries in the region, and these are seen by European Commission as preventing a secure move towards greater decarbonization. That means we have here a major policy challenge with Southeast governments and the EC will have to address. I would like also to mention that despite all this, there are several countries in the region developing in parallel renewables and other carbon free resources such as nuclear power. They are making indeed a serious effort. But to see what's going on with the issue, we need to try to understand what's going on also in Brussels and the related decisions taken there concerning the energy transition and consequently the decarbonization policies. Without a doubt, we need to move rightly towards green energy and energy transition. And why not to become as, e as EU a world leader in this area with a lot of advantages and gains for the uh, European Union. But to keep in mind that at the same time, and for this long transition period, we need to protect the European industry, the European agriculture, the European economy, and at the end, the European society. There are a lot of complaints for this matter from European industries, especially the heavy and the heavy energy consuming ones. Let me try to explain what they say, what are their views. Amid a European environment with certain characteristics, such as low economic growth or even without growth, see Germany, high energy prices, increasing pressure to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, European industry producers are struggling to adapt the low economic growth possibly will continue. The energy prices will remain a key challenge. And the decarbonization process based on the upcoming carbon burden adjustment mechanism will not achieve what it is going to, uh, to design to, to achieve. The result for EU industries will be certainly the decarbonization, but at the same time, a fast procedure faster than in other parts of the world. So the European producers will face difficulties in achieving competitiveness. For this reason, the European industry believes that a more realistic approach to decarbonization should be adopted by EU. And that in turn means the, the reconsideration of both emission trade system, ETS, and carbon border adjustment mechanism. In Europe, the emphasis has been given till now on pursuing an aggressive program for the decarbonization, taking the reliability and the, and the affordability, and hence the energy prices for granted. But it did not happen like that. The pandemic, the war in Ukraine, and the conflicts in the Middle East have proven that supply dependencies must be, must be diversified and the fossil fuel, fuels will be necessary to bridge the transition to green energy. Otherwise, we ask companies to invest in projects with challenging financial difficulties. This in turn leads to the exit of European industries to other places around the world under better conditions see the American Inflation Reduction Act with the incentives to bring foreign companies to the United States of America. 
But if this will happen, there will be a question even for the success of Europe's transition strategy itself. So I hope that a kind of answer is going to be given to us with this uh, event today. Having said that, I'm going to, uh, to give the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Kostis Tabolis. And that I would like to, to ask from all of you that we have 15 minutes each to conclude his presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Kostis, you have the floor. Thank you, Christos. Thank you. Thank you, Christos. I, I will attempt in a very few minutes to give you a broad view of our um, understanding of uh, what's happening in Southeast Europe in terms of decarbonization. And uh, we see here the countries which we cover as an institute, the core countries and the peripheral countries. This is essential in our uh, apprehension of the energy demand supply and uh, energy flows between the countries and interconnections. So, some observations to start with, the differentiation of the regional energy mix, in spite of a uh, considerable amount of work and uh, renewables coming fast and energy efficiency, is still moving in a very slow pace. Some countries are moving faster, other countries slower, but the overall view is that we're not making significant inroads in view of the targets that have been set. There is resistance at local level uh, to the various goals that have been set and uh, uh, which uh, Mrs. Roman uh, referred to at the start. We notice major policy challenges. Uh, different governments have uh, different um, targets and although most of them have accepted the uh, energy and climate uh, national plans. Uh, not all of them are adhering to the targets. Um, obviously, there, there is uh, incompatibility between the countries in West Balkans, which do not belong to the EU, but they comply with uh, energy community regulations and rules, and to the member states. But this gap is narrowing all the time as we approach 2030, which is a crucial year in terms of targets. Given the financial and legal constraints in most countries, the rise of renewables, especially for electricity generation, over the last few years has been impressive, as we say. We have now uh, a lot more renewables in the electricity mix than we had 10 or even 20 years ago. If you were to ask us when we set up the Institute 2003, if we were able to have 40 and 50% contribution of electricity into the electricity mix, we would have told you plainly that's impossible. So over the last 20 years, impressive uh, growth and achievements has been made in this level. The road from now on onwards is going to be more difficult, as you know, and as our friends in renewables, Mr. Tamaresis from CERNA can clearly explain to you, the more renewables now we put into the grid without storage, we have problems because the electricity systems, the electricity grids, in order to maintain stability, they have to dispel new electricity coming in. So electricity grids, in conjunction with renewables is one of the major challenges. And if they tell you that all this is going to be solved with more storage, they don't know what they're talking about because storage is not that flexible. It could be flexible if we use hydro pump schemes, of course, it's a lot less flexible and less of time when we use batteries. Now, I think I have gone fast ahead because I wanted to identify some of the major issues and problems which we are having to face as, as we go on. 
So given the strong market dynamics of the renewable sector, the introduction of hybrid large-scale storage schemes, as I said, in the mid-term and hydrogen in the long term are very clear options uh, which we have to consider. Uh, next slide. I cannot move to the next slide. There is a problem here. All right. Ah, here we are. Sorry. Must be here then. Okay. So it's interesting to see the gross inland consumption with and without Turkey. I will stick to without Turkey because this is our part of the world, but always we'll put Turkey because uh, Turkey by itself is such a big uh, player in, in the whole area. If we consider the whole area, that tends to distort the picture if we put this in. So we, we, we are having with and without. And we see here. What the situation was in 2001, we had a lot of oil, uh, some gas, very little renewables, uh, some part nuclear, and of course a lot of solid fuels, solid fuels being the uh, 27%. And then we move on uh, to 2011, and again we see a lot of solid fuels, but we have definitely more renewables coming into the picture with nuclear remaining. And then we go to 2021 and we see a lot less solid fuels, a lot more renewables, uh, oil more or less the same and uh, gas less because of renewables uh, and, uh, uh, and energy efficiency is coming into the picture. So we have a differentiation but the, as you see it's not a huge, a huge difference in, in the picture. So the, the, the whole energy mix is, is, is definitely going towards the carbonization, but we wouldn't say that we are in a course that we can be very hopeful and predict that things are going to be completely different in about 10 or 15 years. So this is the reality on the ground. Crossing and consumption between Greece and Romania. Greece and Romania are very interesting cases. Uh, Romania has definitely a more balanced energy mix because of nuclear, um, because of uh, oil production of oil and gas, uh, and 2011, and then if we go to 2021, we see different picture because more renewables have come into the picture, more gas has come into the picture, less solid fuels. Uh, so in that, in that sense, you know, Greece and Romania are very mature in their path towards decarbonization. And power generation mix in 2011, as we see here, uh, we have uh, uh, solid fuels, uh, considerable amount, a little uh, renewables, and then we go to 2021, we see a lot more renewables, less solid um, fuels. All this will be in the presentation. So I just wanted as an introduction to bring this into the picture, so we know what the broad issue, the broad picture is. What are the key challenges? Obviously, uh, trying to move away from coal. Uh, there are so important social implications to that. We have to find employment to the people who are being dismissed or are, are being turned down in uh, coal-producing coal areas. And in Greece, we have moved away. Romania is moving away. But there are many other countries in the region which are not going to move away easily. In Bulgaria, in Serbia, in Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, you have a problem there. So, the moving away from coal is not that going to be that easy because coal is definitely uh, proving to be uh, very cost co uh, competitive. Uh, it uh, has a, offers a lot of employment, and there's a lot of uh, economic commercial ties in the regions concerned. So, a very uh, uh, focused regional policy uh, has to be developed. And this is, of course, um, taken care of by EU 
because they have introduced certain incentives at regional level for the transition. How easily this can be implemented, this is another question. So uh, the work on the ground in the field, as we say, is very important when it comes to energy transmission because it's not just a theoretical concept, it's a very practical concept. It means uh, employment, it means uh, salaries, it means trying to find alternative employment, it means trying to, 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 and to introduce into the system alternative fuels. There are some areas like North Macedonia and Serbia which are very coal dependent and the transition there is going to be difficult. Not impossible, but difficult and it will take a lot of planning, resources and incentives. This is where energy efficiency is coming in very helpful because energy efficiency involves a, a, a large amount of uh, different um, capabilities uh, in terms of different uh, uh, skills which come into play and therefore energy efficiency, introducing energy efficiency in a, in a big scale, it perhaps is the uh, best way to try and tackle the transition away from coal, especially at local level. Technologies play, play definitely an important part in the transition. And the more we develop technologies, even at local level, the more chances we have to be able to transit effectively. Um, CCUS, carbon capture and storage, is definitely a technology which is worth considering in our region because of the uh, large-scale uh, coal, coal employment. Um, nuclear is the other one. Uh, more efficient electricity grids. Uh, pumped storage, um, and so forth. We have several technologies. This is just to show you the plant, the existing plant, coal plants in the region, which are not, which are not negligible. You see a lot of uh, new capacity coming over the next few years in some countries. Greece and Romania are, as I said earlier, set in the same path towards decarbonization. This is very clearly seen in these two graphs. And both countries enjoy uh, a lot of solar radiation. Um, Greece more, but also Romania and the northern part of the Eastern Balkans equally a uh, considerable amount of solar radiation and wind. So this is very helpful in the transition away. I won't say more about renewables because there are separate presentations on this, but you will find this in the, uh, in the presentation, which is going to be uh, loaded on the websites of ROIC and IENE. What I would like to, to, to observe, though, is that we see a lot of progress over the last 10 years. Turkey, as you see, has the biggest chunk in terms of installed capacity, but all the rest of the countries also fall follow an upward trend as you can clearly see here and also in terms of the power produced from renewables nuclear nuclear uh, very is very selective in the region but few countries like bulgaria hungary romania slovenia croatia and lately turkey are definitely set on the nuclear path so nuclear is in our view uh, as far as ENA is concerned, a very important uh, area. It's a promise when we're talking about decarbonization because it combines a lot of skills, technology, zero emissions, and steady base load. And if we're serious about transiting, transiting uh, away from um, uh, coal and uh, uh, gas and all that, we need base load. We definitely need base load because renewables, as you all know, are very intermittent. So you, uh, you must have base load and it costs. So nuclear, uh, under certain circumstances and conditions, indeed can prove, can prove very reliable. Not can prove, it has been proven to be reliable. I mean, we have, as you see, most of the reactors who go back to the 80s. So all the countries in the region have very 
good experience in, in running renew, uh, nuclear. Bulgaria and Romania are net electricity exporters to the rest of the region. Why? Because both countries employ nuclear in combination with all other forms. Unless they had nuclear, they wouldn't be able to export consistently week after week, as we can tell you, as we track the market on this, uh, you know, this frequency, the export to all other countries. Sometimes it's Romania, other times it's Bulgaria. But always, they are net electricity exporters to the region. So, nuclear is important and something that, in, in terms of policy, it has to be considered very carefully and not dismissed easily. Costis, we have to speed up. Yes, I'm nearly Th three nearly minutes. At the end. Have been left. Energy security, as I mentioned at the start, is very important as um, as an issue. It emerged lately. I mean, we all, we all know, people who are involved in energy planning and policies. We know that many years. But the, the recent crisis has really catapulted uh, energy security as a key issue because we see, for example, gas, which corresponds to about 20-25% most countries in terms of energy consumption, energy demand, is a determining factor to the operation of the rest of the system. And we saw how going up in terms of uh, prices on gas had resulted in huge increases in electricity. So energy security in terms of having reliable uh, supplies of gas is very important for the operation of the system and this is not going to disappear over the next two or three, five years or ten years. It's going to be with us for the next 20 years at least. Let me remind you that the currently the contracts for gas supply between countries and between companies are running into 15, 20 and 25 year duration. Most of the long-term contracts are between 15 to 25 years. So this tells us something about where gas is going to be in a few years. The region has high degree of energy dependence. This underlies the observation I just made. So obviously we need to um, uh, improve this to lessen the dependence of the region and the countries concerned from imported fuels. Romania is definitely in a very good way on this. It's so shortly becoming a net exporter of gas. And perhaps we can discuss this. I think there are various views on this. But uh, uh, obviously, the more we produce from uh, indigenous sources, uh, the better and the, the less uh, energy dependent we become. Um, and of course, the South Corridor has helped a lot the, re the region in trying to become less energy, less energy import dependent. Greece, for the first time, is becoming a net exporter, although it is an importer of gas. It's also has started exporting to the region. The same Turkey. Turkey and Greece are going to compete over the next few years in terms of gas exports to the region. So gas to gas competition, which was being discussed a few years ago, is now happening. And finally, I would just like to go through the energy demand uh, of the region, which is very indicative. Um, and we see here the EU country member states where we have more or less level in terms of demand. And in fact, the latest projections we have worked out, it's even less, it's even more steep, the, this curve, going, the trend going downwards because of energy efficiency. Uh, the, 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 the economies are becoming more energy efficient in EU countries, therefore the demand is, is, go, is going lower as we move towards target years like 2035 and 2040. On the contrary, West Balkan countries, we are noticing a higher, higher demand, and if we go to Turkey, even higher. And this summarizes the trends 
in the three group of countries, as you see here. So, I won't say any more. I think I have completed the presentation. There's a lot of food for thought. And thank you very much for your attention. Kostis, we thank you for the well-placed analysis. Uh, it covered a lot of ground. Um, we are going to receive uh, questions by the end. Uh, uh, we are going to listen first uh, uh, the, um, all the speakers. Now, we move to our next speaker, is uh, Theodor Tsirika and Octavian Roska. You have the floor. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Uh, we, we have the honor to have with us the ambassador, the Greek ambassador here. So we thank you very much for it. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much. So I restart again. 15 minutes. Uh, dear Madam Ambassador, dear representative of the Ministry of Energy, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here uh, again after a long period of time. And I, I now try to move as uh, fast as possible to my uh, presentation. So now it's I, uh, uh, I thanks to my uh, colleague uh, Octavian, who has, uh, he uh, is an expert in uh, European uh, affairs and uh, he practically helped me in the first part of the, of the presentation. Okay, so just about the COP28 and the update, uh, uh, the role of the nuclear energy. Uh, the last uh, COP was a uh, big success for the uh, nuclear industry. And uh, this is the, uh, the reason why some uh, member states, they call this, uh, uh, dominate this as uh, the nuclear COP because it was the first time when it was recognized the role of nuclear. Uh, there are some other events, uh, events that we, we like to, uh, to underline and to mention. In uh, February 2023, it was uh, EU Nuclear Alliance. They signed a clear uh, signal to recognize the role of uh, nuclear in decarbonization. That alliance includes uh, 12 uh, member states, including, uh, of course, Romania. Uh, in, uh, uh, this is the, the, the COP was in uh, uh, November, December last year, and the practically uh, the, uh, the, the nuclear like-minded member states, they, uh, uh, they signed a declaration on uh, tripling nuclear power production by 2050. Not moving. Cercate in tutte direzioni. Okay, so there are uh, some uh, underlines uh, uh, summarizing the COP28 and nuclear energy. It is, uh, uh, it was discussed about the, it was discussed about the, Small modular reactors as uh, uh, key achievement uh, uh, in uh, net zero emissions. It was highlight the flexibility and compatibility with renewable sources, making uh, uh, pivotal shift towards sustainable energy. Uh, it was a discussion about uh, clean energy champion, recognizing uh, recognized as a low carbon solution. Nuclear power uh, stands out. Uh, it's uh, minimal greenhouse uh, uh, emissions compared with fossil fuel. It is the feature uh, enhancing, uh, regarding enhancing the energy security. There uh, were um, underlined uh, economic and social benefits, uh, safety and sustainability advances, uh, with uh, discussion in showcases advancement in, in, uh, uh, in uh, waste management and, and safety, global collaboration is, 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 a, is a very important point uh, for the nuclear industry, and uh, also uh, aligning with uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
by providing uh, clean uh, and affordable and reliable energy to contribute to the, the climate action. Uh, public perception uh, integration with renewable is, uh, an, is an item where it was uh, progressed. Uh, I remember that uh, some times ago, uh, the supporters of the uh, green energy with the support of nuclear, they hate each other, which is not, not fair at all, because all of us, we have a contribution. And uh, that is uh, what is uh, uh, important here is uh, the policy and the investment uh, uh, needs. And here there are some, uh, some measures that has to be, to be taken. And I presume that in the presentation that would be from the uh, gentleman from the uh, commission will uh, will uh, touch uh, this uh, this uh, subject. Help. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> A press release of the EU Nuclear Alliance uh, from March, uh, probably uh, from last year, I'm sorry. No, it's, this is uh, it's quite recent. Uh, contemplated the, the topics uh, regarding dialogue and closer cooperation. The launch of SMR Industrial Alliance by European uh, Commission. And uh, it is a next uh, event that will be very soon, on March 21st, 2024, will be the first nuclear summit at the head of state and government level to be hosted by Belgium, that they have the, the presidency in this moment, and uh, also the IEA is, uh, is very important uh, there. So uh, the main topics uh, uh, regarding uh, the many EU topics uh, considered by Romania are uh, uh, a level playing field for low carbon technologies, including in terms of financing. Inclusion of nuclear in the taxonomy is a very positive and a very important uh, step ahead for nuclear industry. Uh, financing nuclear projects, especially first of a kind projects such as SMRs, requires a long term commitment from the governments and uh, from the involved uh, stakeholders. Accessing EU funds remains a challenge here. Timely investment are needed for long time operation, life extension projects, as well as new built and innovative projects. Uh, re uh, reco uh, reconfiguration of EU financing instruments having uh, a more inclusive approach for nuclear financing and existing tools, InvestEU, Just Transition Fund, and uh, Repower uh, uh, Europe funds. This another topic is the industrial agenda for the EU. Uh, Net, Zero, Net Zero Industry Act is a good start. We do see the need for integrated approach on the competitiveness at the EU level. International cooperation remains a very important, uh, uh, very important. And uh, Romania is interested in further development of its uh, own uh, nuclear fuel cycle. And I, I will mention later uh, provide some details. Uh, in uh, Europe, we need a start planning for the increased demand of enriched uranium for SMRs. And I'm talking about high assay, low enriched uranium. In the, uh, that means the, the, the enrichment is between 5 to 20% in uh, uranium 2035 isotope. Small modular reactors that Romania is already prepared to join the EU SMR Industrial Alliance. The focus should be uh, on facilitating the deployment of first reactor. We serve as a proof of conceptual and help ramp uh, up, um, up market de demand and uh, therefore economic of scale. To be successful and to contribute to the projects going in different uh, countries, we believe that should include different mature SMR designs. Early cooperation is also very important and uh, the SMR, my colleague in, uh, in the next session will, uh, will, will, mention, will present the uh, small modular reactors. The National Energy uh, and Climate Plan of Romania includes the continuation of our nuclear projects in Chernobyl, the deployment of SMR, as well as the acceleration innovation, innovative technologies such, such as uh, advanced modular reactors, uh, ref referring to the uh, 
Alfred project, which is in the, uh, developed uh, by Romania with the Italy at the, the Nuclear Research Institute from Pitești. Just uh, uh, an overview of our major projects. Uh, what is uh, marked with a red star uh, are projects they have uh, also uh, <coughs> uh, North Atlantic uh, uh, participation there. This refurbishment of Unit 1, in my opinion, is the most important project because with the period of time that will stay with only one unit in operation, so we, with that we need that, that uh, period to be not too long. Two new candle reactors that we hope to finalize uh, around 2031, SMR development, tritium removal facility, integrated front end nuclear fuel cycle, and Alfred uh, reactor in Tibesh. That is the nuclear fuel cycle. I don't uh, go to, to, to details. Is the nuclear fuel cycle practically is moving, starting uh, on the uh, left hand, and this is on the upside, and after that coming coming back. He start mining, is processing <laughs> uranium. Already nuclear electrica acquired one uh, one of the of the uh, uranium processing uh, plant that is in uh, in uh, in the north of uh, province of uh, uh, south of Carpathia, I say better. And uh, after that, we, we have uh, our uh, nuclear fuel uh, plant that is in our in the nuclear electrica. The fuel practically is going through the reactor. And after that, uh, uh, for uh, will be uh, interim stored in uh, at Chernobyl the site. And that will be the, the, the future uh, stage will be the final disposal uh, of uh, nuclear fuel. This is different, uh, the low and medium waste disposal and the spent fuel uh, disposal. Refurbishment of uh, Unit 1 uh, is uh, partic practically first phase was finalized. Now we are in the second phase. Uh, ongoing project implementation, uh, EBC contract, uh, licensing, uh, commission opinion, that you know that is uh, Article 41 of the Euratom Treaty. There is an obligation of the member states to notify the Commission about the project and they have to receive an opinion. From, uh, and that opinion is very important because uh, investors and banks, they are considering that opinion. It's not stipulated in the treaty that is a positive or negative opinion. That is matter of perception, how it's written by the, by the Commission there. We, we had that experience uh, for uh, uh, Unit 3 and 4. Unfortunately, the long delay of the project, we are in, required by the Commission to redo the job. So now we are, we are expecting the, the notification from uh, for, uh, this project. So uh, in February in uh, 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 last year, it was uh, signed the first uh, contract with Candu Energy, SSC Lavana, for engineering services. Uh, in October last year, uh, Korean Hydro Nuclear Power uh, joined Candu uh, Energy, Saldo Nucleare, EPC Consortium. And uh, in uh, last uh, November in Paris, in Paris, it was signed uh, a three way contract between Canadian Commercial Corpora Corporation, Candu Energy Incorporated, and Nuclear Electrica. Uh, supporting the works to extend the life of Unit 1. That we, we practically, we concluded the contract for renting this very specific dedicated tools for uh, replacing the, the, the core of the reactor, as well as uh, the, uh, the, 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 the financing for uh, long lead uh, items. In the phase three, that will be the, the effective uh, development of the refurbishment uh, from the end of 2026, after Christmas, we shut down the plant, to the beginning of 2029. The <coughs> tritium removal facility is uh, an interesting project. There are, in this moment, there are only two uh, such facility facilities in the, in, in the world. One is in Canada, one is in, uh, in uh, Korea. And uh, this is very important. Three, three minutes have, have, have been left. Three minutes, okay? Okay, give me two more, please. Okay, thank you. 
we can negotiate. <laughs> so uh, that uh, uh, you know that in the, in, the, in, the, in the process in the reactor, the heavy water, uh, practically the deuterium, is m moving to the uh, tritium isotope, which is very high radioactive. So that practically is uh, like uh, cleaning the blood in an in a external uh, facility, is that is the, this tritium facility that will facilitate the access of the workers in the, uh, easy, okay. It was done at the beginning, uh, the, the first in the point, point of the pro, John. Uh, no, it was not that facility, but we have to, to quantify the, uh, the number of the workers and the time they stay there. And practically is uh, many more times the, the human capacity you need. Now here we can uh, uh, use more uh, human resources. And uh, the thing is that the tritium produce is a good, uh, very good for the fusion, fusion project. So we are in some discussions with ITER in the moment on that will be completely to, to, to do that. Chernobyl 3 and 4 is uh, Kandu Engineering is providing the engineering services and updating uh, the previous activities done when we started the first time with this, this project. In uh, August 22, shareholders approved the preliminary investment decision. Uh, according to the strategy, it's expected to have unit one in 2030, unit, uh, sorry, three in 2030. 2030 and Unit 4 in 2031. Unit 2 represents the reference project. The project will benefit from the experience of the Kandu technology and the Romanian engineering and industry will be part of this effort. Here I have a, there is an issue here <coughs> because uh, we have to, to discuss and to, to see about to revigorate the uh, Romania supply chain, which unfortunately is not the same one which was when we built the units one and the unit two. So this gap, practically, the industry lost the interest. And uh, that is a, is a matter as far as we have an energy strategy. <coughs> we have a nuclear <coughs> energy strategy. We have to understand very well that supply chain, national supply chain, is part of that nuclear strategy of Romania. So um, here, in uh, it was uh, uh, signed, uh, Romania State and the Nuclear Retica signed the support agreement for Unit 3 and 4, which is a very important tool in financing uh, this, this project. Uh, regarding the financing, uh, it was uh, in September 23, it was uh, signed uh, an, uh, an, a memorandum for releasing about 3 billion Canadian dollars for the project. Uh, recently in February, uh, Italians, uh, <coughs> Sace and uh, Asaldo Nucleare, we uh, concluded an uh, MOU for uh, about 2 billion uh, euros. <coughs> now that so practically is, uh, the project is, is, going, is going well here. About new scale, I, 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 I let my colleague because he has a, a spe specific presentation on, on uh, new scale. Just I put some uh, uh, generic uh, information here, what is Doicești, somewhere north-west uh, from Bucharest, about uh, 70 kilometers from here. Financing uh, in uh, general financing in G7 summit, uh, President Biden announced that uh, two US financial institutions have issued letter of interest for potential loading up to 4 billion United doctor, uh, dollars for SMR project to be developed in Romania. And also at that time, it was expressed the support of US and Japan, as well as South Korea and the United Arab Emirates, uh, up to uh, 275 uh, million uh, US for SMR project to be implemented in Romania. That is uh, the last one is the uh, 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 lead, uh, molten lead uh, uh, reactor that is uh, under the is an advanced. Uh, fast uh, breeder reactor that is uh, under development in, uh, in Pitesh at the Nuclear Research Institute in cooperation with the Italian. Nuclear Retica is supporting that activity and the, uh, the, the project is financed mainly by the Ministry of Research on, on, uh, and Innovation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you indeed for, for uh, your interesting presentation. And uh, now we move to our next speaker, um, Ms. Ramona Moldovan from uh, the Greek Ministry. Romania. Romania, yes. Sorry, sorry. For the moment in Romania. Yes. Uh, we are very happy that we have uh, you here with us. So we are going to, to hear you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting us here and thank you for having this type of events. I think it's important to, to have the stakeholders not only at the, the national level, but also at the regional level and to find solutions how to move forward together, uh, especially in this domain with these dynamics and with these ambitious um, targets that we committed to achieve uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, my topic today, or my, my purpose today, is to uh, tell you a bit about the, uh, the evolution and our plans in terms of renewable energy and the investments, and what is the ministry uh, doing in, in, uh, in this field, what is already ongoing, and what are the plans for 2030 and uh, 2050. Uh, as you all know, we, uh, at the strategy level, at the commitment levels, we have the Fit for 55 package and the Green Deal package at European level, and we as country are committed to achieve those results together with, uh, with Europe. Thus, we are focusing all our reforms, but also investments from different and, and various uh, finance, financial support to achieve those targets. Among the, the, the targets, a biggest and important part relates to uh, increase the uh, energy, the green energy, and especially the one coming from renewable sources. As mentioned also in the, in the study and in the presentation before, Romania is on a, a, a trend, on, on a path to increase, uh, to, to have investments in the field, also at the prosumer's level, but also at the producer's level. Uh, however, our uh, ambitious is higher as uh, in the national plan for uh, climate and energy. The target is to, to reach uh, 10 gigawatts till 2030 in renewables and uh, uh, to, to go higher till 2050. In this respect, uh, it's not just the focus on um, investments, but also with reforms. And I will start with those ones and then I will enter into uh, a bit of details on uh, the, the, the call for applications we launched or they are in process to be launched and the type of investments we are uh, aiming to achieve. So in terms of reforms, this relates very well with the National Resilience and Recovery Plan, where we committed to um, uh, simplify the legislation on um, actually installing and putting at work the renewable energy sources. And this is a package of legislation that is developed or amended by the ministry together with the national regulator and together with the uh, commission's committees in the Romanian parliament. Uh, and uh, the aim is this year, because it's one of the reforms, uh, part of the next payment request that, that will be uh, submitted by Romania under NRRP, uh, to uh, simplify the procedure, procedures, not only for the uh, prosumers, but also for, um, for producers uh, on renewable energy. On uh, uh, another reform important uh, that is associated with Repower EU component of NRRP relates with uh, helping um, <coughs> industry, but especially the, the residential areas, to uh, prepare their uh, investments, uh, to prepare their files, and to submit the uh, the files uh, in a unit harmonized, unitary, and simplified manner. Uh, other measures uh, included in the simplification of the legislation relates to issuing the permit to connect to the grid and how to balance the <clears throat> the type of energy. This will be in the same the same package of legislation that is work in uh, progress. Another type of reform that is interconnected with uh, the, the, the measures in the energy field 
relates with decarbonization of the heating and cooling system. This is another reform important, especially in our country, as we have a variety of uh, measures uh, applied at municipalities and also rural areas. It is challenging. Uh, uh, it will require a lot of uh, mediation and uh, innovative solutions to, to move forward. But it is, again, a reform that we are uh, having uh, uh, working progress. And I will not insist more on the, the reforms because you will be our partners also in the consultation and the debate uh, process of these reforms. And I will move to the uh, investments uh, we have ongoing or will be launched very soon in terms of uh, renewable energy mm -hmm. and where these uh, capacities will be installed and when. Um, as you know, uh, the, the the first uh, big call on the renewable in the last years were uh, launched under NRRP Investment uh, One. Uh, we managed to finish the evaluation and to sign the contract uh, end of 2023. Uh, and uh, the target in NRRP was uh, 90, 60 megawatts. We managed to sign contracts for almost 2,000 megawatts. And uh, many of these projects are already mature and probably we will start already paying and uh, putting into, into the grid uh, uh, the, the new capacities. Uh, in December 2023, we launched another call on uh, renewable energy, this time uh, financed from a modernization <coughs> fund. Modernization fund is actually the main instrument from which we are financing the investments in the renew renewable. Uh, the call launched in December was open for public authorities and public institutions from different areas. And uh, the, the call was closed the beginning of March, 6th of March, 500 uh, uh, million euro. Um, we expect to, to have uh, for, for self-consumption, for self-consumption is not for production, but anyway, this energy will be produced for public, uh, will, be, will be used for public uh, buildings. Uh, another investment that is prepared to be launched uh, actually tomorrow, I think it will be launched, uh, again, uh, financed from Modernization Fund, relates to self-consumption, but also uh, there are two uh, sub-investments, one for self-consumption for industry, the other one is for production. Uh, of renewable energy, um, uh, uh, in total uh, 815 million euro, the call, and will be closed, it will be launched probably uh, today and will be open for submitting the projects uh, 90 days. And we hope, uh, and actually this is the, the feedback we received also from the market, um, those who did not manage to have the contract signed under NRRP because the, the, the demand was quite high will be able to submit here their application and uh, or start uh, the evaluation and contracting process. It is a competitive call. Um, in terms of um, investments on, uh, on renewables, maybe to mention, we opened the call for three main sources, solar, wind, and uh, hydro. On um, uh, NRRP, 80% or maybe more than 80% of the projects were on uh, solar, uh, very few on wind, uh, nothing on, uh, on uh, hydropower. We are going to see on these uh, this, uh, next calls, but the, the feedback we receive from the market is uh, more or less uh, uh, similar. This is why I'll move uh, and to present you a bit about the, the next type of investment we are planning to launch end of March, most probably, is the a contract for difference uh, call. Uh, this is a, a new scheme actually under modernization fund. It's for the first time a modernization fund finance a CFD uh, type of uh, contract for difference type of investment. This will be, uh, it is also related with an RRP where we have uh, a target to have two, two uh, tender procedures on, uh, on these ones. Uh, one uh, to be, to cover 1,500 uh, megawatts, the, the next one 2,000 megawatts. In uh, the CFD, we are uh, increasing this, uh, this um, target 
the first call will be for 2,000 megawatts, the next, uh, the next call for 3,000 uh, megawatts. Uh, and the contract for difference will be uh, for wind and solar, 50-50. The capacity uh, contracts being uh, implemented for 15 years. We hope to have a success and to, uh, to see um, a, a price that will balance the, the market. This will be, let's say, the upcoming uh, or the, the recent investments and the upcoming investments. You can see uh, on the amounts, uh, uh, on CFD, the amount is 3 billion euro uh, to be covered. So what I have mentioned already, I think we reach uh, almost uh, 4.5 billion euro investments uh, in, uh, in renewable till 2030. The first ones to be deployed by 2025 uh, in RRP, the, the next ones from modernization fund till 2030, and of course, uh, the ones from uh, contract for difference will have 15 years to, to go forward. Now, uh, I will not stop here because we cannot talk about having renewable energy when we miss two things or we are not going in parallel with two other things. First, the capacity of the grid to absorb uh, and to, to balance this type of um, uh, green energy, and then the storage capacity. So um, we are investing both from NRRP and from a modernization fund, you know, also these two uh, priorities. Uh, in terms of capacity of the grid, um, from modernization fund, we already have contracts signed with the distributors. Uh, um, amount in the, I think, 600 million euro already uh, contracts signed. Uh, this means these are ongoing contracts uh, with the distributors to modernize and to upgrade and to digitalize the the grids to to make sure. It is uh, able to to use these uh, new capacities of, uh, of energy, and on the other hand, uh, in, uh, in the next investment committee of uh, modernization fund, we'll top up the amount on uh, on this type of investments uh, to reach uh, 1.1 billion euro to modernize the the grids. The target being uh, 2030 to have the contracts uh, already operational, the investments operational. Um, and the last point I would, like to, I, I would like to underline is the storage capacity. We started the investments on, the, on storage uh, through NRRP, the National Resilience and Recovery Plan. It is a call of 79 uh, million euro. Uh, the target is to uh, have to, to, to have a capacity of uh, 200 uh, megawatts uh, capacity of, of storage by 2026. Uh, this uh, call, unfortunately, we had to relaunch it. Now it's still open by the end of March. So whomever is uh, interested can still submit their, their application. Uh, in addition, we are preparing a scheme, another state aid scheme uh, for uh, storage uh, financed from a modernization fund. We are still in discussion with DG Clima and with DG Competition on uh, the package, but uh, we aim to allocate 500 million euro uh, for future storage capacities in Romania. And of course, uh, I will not close this discussion without underlying the the, the project, the big project that uh, SAPE is uh, organizing on Tarnitsa uh, Lepushnești investment. Thank you. Um, I'm here for, for questions uh, for in this panel. Um, and uh, I really hope to see your efforts and our efforts put to practice. Thank you. Okay. We thank you very much. It is uh, very crucial indeed to, to hear the, the approach of the authorities always, uh, their interventions, their way of thinking, and uh, the regulations. Uh, certainly, uh, we are going to have some uh, questions at the end of um, uh, our presentations. Now, quickly, we move to our uh, next speaker, 
my understanding this is coming online. Okay, is Marius Logo from European Commission, and uh, he's going to to speak about Repower EU. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about something important to all of us. Making our energy use cleaner and getting away from relying on fossil fuel, especially considering Russia's uh, ongoing war against Ukraine and how it is affecting energy around the world. This situation is pushing us to act boldly, come up with new ideas and stick together. This is exactly what the Repower EU plan and our recovery efforts, including the recovery and resilience facility, are all about. My name is Marius Lungu. I'm a policy officer in the Secretary General of the Commission, and I will spend the next minutes to tell you what is behind the Repower EU initiative, where we are and where we come from. First, the Repower EU plan is not just another policy idea. It is a response to the current energy crisis fueled by global tensions, and it stands on three main pillars. The first pillar is cutting down on our reliance on fossil fuel. It is not that we are short on natural gas. It is our dependency on a single source, which not only harms the climate, but has now become a tool in warfare. So having different sources of energy is crucial. Second, ramping up renewable energy. We should all aim to lead the world into a future where clean energy is the norm, supported, of course, by strong infrastructure and storage solutions to speed up the use of renewables. Third, improving energy efficiency. By investing, by investing in making things more energy efficient, like upgrading buildings and improving industrial processes, we can use less energy overall. This also means encouraging people to be smarter about how they use energy. To fund all these necessary investments, we are mainly using the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which offers more than, two, more than 650 billion euros, with a dedicated available funding, of course, for Repower EU chapters of 20 billion euros in grants and the remaining 225 million euros available in loans to all member states. Now let us get into some specifics. So far, the Commission has approved 23 Repower EU chapters, combining reforms and investments totaling 60 billion euros. These funds will boost renewable energy generation, help save energy with energy efficiency renovations, decarbonize the industry, and make our energy networks more resilient. Of course, these investments are backed by significant energy reforms, tackling both new and old challenges, focusing on making it easier to use renewable energy and improving access to the electricity networks, basically steering electricity markets towards clean energy transition. To give you an idea, the Repower EU chapter will add 20 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity to the existing 60 gigawatt already supported by RRF, will save up to 28 million megawatt hours of energy each year by making, more, by making both private and public buildings more energy efficient and helping businesses to cut down on energy use. We'll build new or upgrade over 3,000 kilometers of power lines and add 2.5 gigawatt in large scale electricity storage to, to support the uptake of renewable energy. We'll also deliver important gas infrastructure projects across Europe to ensure a stable energy supply. The RRF does not more than just pay for projects that help countries upgrade their power systems. It also helps change the rules and guidelines so that our power sector can be more flexible, eco-friendly and cost-effective. Here are a couple of examples. Greece has introduced their first law focused on offshore wind energy. This law sets clear rules for starting getting permission for, connecting to the power grid and running wind energy projects out in the sea. Poland and Hungary, for example, are doing similar reforms for on onshore wind. Austria has passed the renewable expansion law, 
which aims to make sure that by 2030, all electricity supplied in the country comes from renewable sources. But now let's talk about Romania part in, 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 in all this. Decarbonization is a key element of the Romanian Recovery and Resilience Plan. Romania is moving away from coal with significant investment in renewables and cleaner gas fire power plants to ensure a smooth, a smooth transition to clean energy. Romania's Repower EU chapter includes new reforms and investments to meet our goals of being independent from fossil fuels. This involves accelerating renewable energy production, making homes more energy efficient, and strengthening our power transmission network. To give you a gist of it, more than 1,200 homeowners will get support to install solar panels, and over 30,000 will receive help to make their homes more energy efficient. There is also targeted support for energy poor and vulnerable households. In terms of reforms, a new one-stop shop will offer advice on energy efficiency and renewable energy production for homeowners. Plus, the government will list all available degraded lands for renewable energy projects. Now, looking forward, we need to focus on putting these plans into action quickly and efficiently. Ladies and gentlemen, I have given you only a, a snapshot on the Repower EU. In summary, the Recovery and Resilience Facility is the key funding tool to deliver the Repower EU plan. The EU plan to save energy, produce more clean energy, and diversify its energy supplies, consequently reducing dependency from Russian fossil fuels. The RRF's performance-based model, where payments are contingent on the delivery of pre-agreed reforms and investments by member states, help to speed up and multiply the impact of green investments. Thank you, and I wish you a fruitful discussion. Despite... Okay. Um, now we are moving to our next speaker, Ioannis Tamaresis. private sector from Terna Energy. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Damares. He's coming from Greece. I represent the Greek Terna Energy, a pioneer in uh, renewables, established back in 1997, and uh, listed in the stock exchange of Athens in 2007. So the last 20 years, we have managed to establish Terna Energy as the leader in the renewables uh, in Greece, having more than 1.2 gigawatt operational, and uh, more than one gigawatt under construction currently. Uh, mainly we are focusing in wind, and as you can see in our portfolio, more than 95% uh, relies on wind power, and uh, we have a small, let's say, participation in the solar and the hydro, but the plan is to enlarge our presence uh, in the solar business. We are present not only in Greece, uh, we are present in Bulgaria and in Poland, and in other countries, in Balkans, and especially in Romania, where we are trying to acquire and, uh, projects and establish our footprint here. Mm -hmm. So, very briefly, you can see, let's say, an outlook of uh, our portfolio. I have, would like to mention two landmark projects uh, that we have made. The one uh, that attracted, let's say, the attention of the investment public in the European level. The first one is that we managed to transform a rocky island called St. George to a wind farm with uh, almost 80 megawatt capacity with a submarine cable connecting this rocky island with continental Greece. And uh, the second project that we'd like to mention is uh, Cafireas Wind Farm, which is the largest uh, wind project in Greece with 330 megawatt capacity. And the third one is a project that we have started already the construction, uh, named, uh, it's a pump storage uh, project named Amphilochia, with capacity 680 megawatt. And as Mr. Stamboli said earlier, we believe that that kind of projects will be able to give uh, stability to the grid. So to us, uh, it seems like a very big battery, this pump storage project. 
So obviously we are working with project finance, our portfolio is in non-recourse project finance, which secure the interest rates, etc. And uh, we have set big targets. Next slide, please. Big targets to uh, reach the six gigawatt in 2030. And for that reason, we are trying to expand our activities in other, let's say, sources beside wind, such as uh, uh, hydroelectric, solar, and uh, maybe geothermy, etc. And obviously, to expand our footprint in other countries. And as I said earlier, uh, Romania is the case for us. Uh, we are present in Bulgaria and in uh, Poland since 2010. And uh, the reason that we haven't uh, uh, enlarged our presence there is associated mainly, mainly with the political situation in these two countries, something that we will discuss uh, later on. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here is the install capacity. As you can see, it's very important to mention that uh, we are developing uh, projects by ourselves. We have uh, very specialized teams with huge experience uh, that are running our uh, projects. And it's very important to highlight the fact that uh, we, Internal Energy, we are starting a project from Alpha to Omega, meaning that we are finding the opportunity, we are developing the project, we are financing the project, we are participating in the CFDs when the case is, we are constructing, financing, and finally operating uh, the project. So the accumulated experience is very big, and uh, this allows us to easily penetrate to other markets in other and in other countries. Okay, this is what I just mentioned before. Uh, more or less, uh, we can see that uh, we have our internal wind and energy laboratory. Uh, and uh, we are trying to, and not to we have tried, we already supported Greece to reach the national targets in terms of uh, renewables. And uh, we have secured project financing and uh, we think that uh, we'll be able to fully support our uh, development in the near future and to reach our targets. Okay, as I said before, we have uh, big plans to reach uh, the 6 gigawatt in uh, the next uh, five years. Although it seems very, very challenging, we still believe that we will have the uh, uh, opportunity to achieve that. <laughs> and uh, we do hope that uh, Romania will be able uh, to help us to reach this target uh, very soon. Okay. So I would like to stay a bit more on this uh, slide, where uh, we are presenting here our uh, presence in Poland and in Bulgaria. As I said, in Poland we have 10 farms, we established there since 2008, and till 2015 our development pace was uh, really fast, and we were uh, keep uh, buying, constructing, financing projects, etc., until uh, the political situation uh, slowed down our uh, expansion there. I don't know if you are aware, it's a distance act. It's a law that adapted in 2016, according to which a wind farm cannot be uh, closer than the 10 h. 10 h is the distance 10 times of uh, the diameter of uh, the blades. So in few words, we haven't seen any new projects, in, uh, wind projects in Poland the last, uh, let's say, six years. And on the contrary, we are seeing many PV projects. So back in 2015, we had we had almost seven gigawatt of wind and none in solar. And uh, right now, the solar installations are exceeding uh, the, the wind uh, installations. Nevertheless, we are uh, trying to be well positioned in the market. We have started the development of uh, three wind projects with total capacity of 180 megawatt. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are still waiting the abolishment of the distance act. The same story applies in Bulgaria, but uh, let's say that the problem there uh, for, uh, let's say, not uh, extending our uh, footprint in Bulgaria was uh, the grid situation and the political situation. Uh, meaning that we were uh, really surprised to see a few years ago, I mean, uh, six, seven years ago, that they were imposing all the time new taxes, retroactive uh, legislation, uh, legislation with retroactive effect 
that for sure was not encouraging uh, new investments. And from my point of view, this is the main reason why we don't see major players, I mean foreign players, foreign investors uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, nevertheless, we are still optimistic. Uh, we have managed to establish and develop a new project, a PV project of 130 megawatts. We are developing also a wind project there. So we do hope that uh, very soon we'll be able to enlarge further our presence there. So uh, now let's focus uh, to the challenges that we are facing. And uh, I would like to mention that since we have more or less the common targets in the European Union, we see that the challenges more or less are the same and, ide and identical more or less, especially in the Balkans. So obviously the grid connection. This is the most important uh, parameter for every discussion about the further development of renewables. So in every country, we see that the grid connection needs more support with faster pace to proceed and uh, to finance uh, these projects. This is the key element. The second topic is about the land use. I mean, all of you, you are familiar about uh, the fact that uh, we have the categories uh, of classification of arable land or no, and where the solar can be located, etc. Uh, I would like to mention that definitely we need to find an equilibrium, a balance about the necessary way to exploit the land, because obviously it's not uh, prudent to utilize all arable land for solar. But I would like to highlight here that the booming in the development of solar projects led to very high uh, increase of the lease uh, rates, leasing rates. So you were, uh, you could find, let's say, a few years ago, uh, 80 euro per, uh, sorry, 800 euro per square meter. Now they are asking uh, 3,000 euro per uh, hectare. Sorry. The third point that it was uh, the economic and financial challenges. Okay, I think that we are uh, very soon, uh, very close to bypass this issue due to the fact that we have experienced a period with high interest rates due to COVID uh, effect, and uh, we see in the futures that uh, there is a tendency to see lower interest rates soon. Let's hope that this will happen because, being frank, the very high interest co uh, cost is a problem uh, for the projects. The political challenges, as I said before, I mean, we are seeing countries like Poland, as I said, a, a country fully dependent with coal, with uh, continuous disputes with the European Union about uh, the coal and their policies, etc. And uh, on top of that, they are trying to stop the development of renewables. That's why, they, as I said, they have the Distance Act, etc. We see countries like Hungary that the last years they had introduced the Robin Hood tax, as well as uh, they have uh, uh, forbidden, let's say, the construction of any wind project, which does not make sense, and other countries, let's say, more or less. And about energy storage, this uh, is something very important for the grid stability, let's say. Uh, if you would like to have my personal uh, point of view, and I'm not representing Ten Energy on that, I think that uh, this is something very promising. But I believe that uh, we need a uh, few more steps to make in order to see how we can uh, include it in our uh, daily business, let's say, because it's very expensive. We are seeing that the cannibalization of the market, because as more and more solar and PV projects are entering the market, very, very soon we have negative prices. So it's something that definitely we are monitoring closely. And uh, we do believe that in the near future will be more uh, attractive for invest from invest investment point of view. Okay, so a few slides about our experience in Romania. As I said, we believe that uh, Romania is a country that will help us to reach uh, our targets. Uh, on top of that, we are present in Romania since 2008. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we. we didn't succeed to secure a project in the first wave of development. And uh, also our parent company, Jack Terran Construction Company, is for many years present here. We have uh, many works and projects with CFAR, uh, with commercial buildings, etc. 
So in 2021, we have started uh, evaluating the Romanian market. And indeed, we have uh, checked with my team almost three gigawatt of projects. Uh, we have met so many developers. And uh, the good thing is that we have met uh, many, many consultants. And I have to highlight here that uh, the level of the consultants of the people that we met in Romania, it was uh, and is extraordinary. Very, very experienced uh, colleagues, uh, technical advisors, uh, legal advisors, energy specialists, help us in every step. And it's very important for the future development. Uh, additionally, I would like to mention about the financing. I mean, uh, when we have started to monitoring the market about project financing, and I'm talking about a non-recourse financing for renewable energy projects, and having in mind that you don't have yet the CFD, a support system, a scheme that will allow a project to have a secured cash flow for the next 15 years, which in turn will allow to project finance the project. It was very big surprise to us to hear from more than three, four important international banks that they are ready to finance projects even with a five-year or a three-year PPA and without CFD. So this is uh, something that I would like to highlight and uh, I believe that uh, all investors should take advantage and uh, focus on uh, this kind of investments. Because in other countries, the banking system is not so strong and not so dynamic. And this is a problem. So, however, I have to mention that we have met many developers. Many of them were serious. For others, I could say that were more like dreamers, but in the next slide, I will explain more. So, as I said before, uh, nothing is easy in this life. So, there are many obstacles to bypass. So, the first problem for us, and I will make, a, I will say a few words as investor, as a foreign investor, and the problems that we are facing here. The major problem is that everybody has a project. So, everybody wants to sell a project. And everybody has a different, uh, let's say, definition of what means ready to build. So, as I said before, we have many developers. <laughs> so, a few developers are saying that ready to build is according to the ATR moment. Other developers saying is according to the connection agreement or whatever. The problem and the major problem to me is the bottom line here. <laughs> we have in Romania just five gigawatt of renewables, and there are almost 50 gigawatts granted the ATRs. Okay, this is, uh, I won't say, this is a market distortion. And uh, I don't believe that uh, the policymakers ever had this intention. And it's good, uh, according to what we are hearing, that very, very soon this is going to change and you will put some tenders for the grid capacity from modern, etc., which is very welcome. Because this will give a clear view and the status about uh, the market. So, so many ETRs. Everybody with just a few thousand euro paying a consultant to make a study can have an ATR and then can have a pre-agreement for leasing a land and then easily he has a project. So, some of the developers are dreamers and believe that they can become so easily millionaires. And, uh, okay, we're not that case, but I'm just saying that this creates problems because they are blocking the grid capacity. And uh, it's blocked the capacity by investors who don't have the financial capacity and capability to implement the projects. And this does not allow the development of renewables. And from my personal point of view, the five gigawatt of renewables in Romania is very, very low number in relation with the dynamic of Romania, which is the second biggest country in uh, Central Eastern Europe. <laughs> okay. Obviously, the huge demand of ATR, because everybody was looking for ATR, led to increased cost of LLAs. But let's go to the second, uh, let's say, column. Because uh, TSO and DSO they are so busy, only for examining the huge number of uh, ATRs. And uh, every, they are giving, let's say, ATRs with the TI, TR, with uh, criteria N, criteria N minus one, reinforcement. And all this lead to a situation where you cannot know the total capex of an investment because you will find out how much is the total capex when you will know well how much is the connection cost. And unfortunately, with all these conditions in TIs and ATRs 
etc. You will be able to learn the cost only at COD. And this is very bad also for the banks, but also for the investor. Three minutes left. Oh, I'm offensive. I'm only five. So, uh, another trick that the developers found was to develop projects in high voltage, 400 kV. Okay, this is normal and, uh, for some investors, but uh, being honest with you, a project of 400 megawatt is not so attractive, especially for a foreign investor, a newcomer here, because it's very complicated sometimes. Obviously, the grid upgrade uh, advances with slower pace uh, from what it was planned, but it's a good track, let's say. And let's see now the risks that we are facing. As I said, the uncertainty of the final connection cost and the time, because many projects share the same connection works. And this is a very serious obstacle, which in few words means that I cannot finish my project if uh, my neighbor uh, does not finish his projects, dependent projects. So, as I said before in the beginning, many developers consider ready to build uh, status uh, the ATR moment. The risk associated with the curtailments, very important, the extremely high balancing costs, and this is something that the policy makers should uh, pay focus on that and try to improve it because you have very, very high balancing costs. And also the lack of support schemes and long-term BPAs, which finally will be solved with the CFDs that we expect uh, within this year. And this is a very, very important step. Okay, obviously the selling prices per megawatt doubled the last three years due to the huge demand. Next slide, please. I would like to highlight that uh, three years ago they were asking the developer 60,000 euro per megawatt, then now they are asking even 180,000. Okay, here briefly the challenges. Grid capacity number one, framework uh, second, new technologies, project finance, and obviously the expectation. As I said, the CFDs is very, very important because it will allow easily the long-term financing for many investors and non, not only for the big international companies. The corporate PPAs could be definitely an alternative. And I believe that the next two, three years we will see more progress in Romania. And that's all. Thank you indeed, thank you. Uh, you have uh, covered a lot of uh, ground of your company, your ambitions, your plans, your uh, difficulties. Thank you very much. So, um, please, uh, um, uh, all the panelists here to take the seat in order to start the discussion. So I'm the ambassador of Greece, Lily Grammatica, and uh, I just, I don't have questions, or I have a thousand questions, but I will take this opportunity for uh, a very few comments, uh, and I will be brief. Uh, I thank uh, uh, the Institute uh, for Energy for Southeastern Europe, Mr. Stavolis, Mr. Dimas, uh, and the Romania Energy Center for this event. Uh, now, my presence here attests to the importance uh, that Greece pays and uh, how much a priority it is for Greece, the energy developments uh, in the region uh, and in Europe uh, in this critical juncture. Of course, it is, uh, on one hand, the, the climate change and the developments uh, for uh, uh, clean energy and the policies for clean energy that are being pushed through and for renewables uh, in Europe and worldwide, uh, and the new targets for decarbonization. And uh, at the same time, we have the aggression of uh, Russia, the Russian aggression on Ukraine that has um, uh, given more impetus to the need uh, to become uh, energy resilient and have energy security and diver diversification of sources. So Greece's role in this uh, has become more important. Uh, we have developments and, um, and it's very interesting for us to follow in this region such informative events. I also have a colleague here who will follow the entire um, meeting and all the panels. Now, uh, for Greece, one is uh, having uh, 
uh, even though it's not completely decarbonization, gas, as Mr. Stabolis uh, demonstrated in, uh, with the figures he presented, is here and will be an important source of energy for the next uh, decades coming up. So uh, for Greece, the development of uh, the capacity uh, of exporting through Revithusa terminals, through the new FSRU regasification floating platform in Alexandropolis, through the new interconnector Greece-Bulgaria uh, and its increasing capacity uh, to uh, the entire region, uh, contributing to uh, the energy security, including uh, for Moldova and Ukraine, where there's in Ukraine uh, gas storage capacity that has already started being used with gas coming from Greece. Uh, second very important development here in Romania is the, the entry of the uh, Greek uh, energy company, PPC, the E, which bought out Romania and L. Uh, it's a big investment, 1.3 billion euros. And uh, there is also interest for investing in renewables here. And uh, another parameter that Greece follows with interest, even though we're we don't have nuclear power plants and we're not uh, uh, a country that has in the works any nuclear power plants, is the developments in nuclear energy and, and uh, the technologies, including the SMRs. So that also we're following very closely. Uh, and uh, this is an area where Greece and Greek businesses, as Terna and as other companies, as they have a lot to offer. It's very important that we join our forces in Southeastern Europe. There is a new corridor that needs investments um, for uh, coming uh, and being materialized soon. A corridor of starting from Greece, Northern Greece, through Bulgaria, connecting Romania, and uh, which will be to the benefit of the entire region. Thank you. Okay, we thank you. Next question, please. Do you want to address this question to a particular person, or is it general? It's a general question. So when this problem appeared, CO2 in the atmosphere, the global warming, greenhouse effect, and so on, there were two solutions. One was stop burning coal and fossil fuel for that matter. And the second problem, the second solution was then capturing and storing the CO2 emitted in the atmosphere. I hear today a lot of talk about decarbonization by stopping burning fuel, uh, fossil fuel. But this solution of CCS, carbon capture and storage, in southeastern Europe, it is abandoned. It doesn't work. In other parts of the world, I know it is going on. They build now capacity of storing CO2. What about here in our area? The Romanian ministry wants to comment on it. No. Okay. We recently carried out a study in Greece on CCUS and how this can be applied. There is a lot of interest from industry and there is very little interest, very little interest from electricity companies. Electricity companies are producers of coal and users on thermal plants are very reluctant to use a CCUS. On the other hand, industries like cement industry, refineries uh, are uh, very interested. In fact, they're going ahead with actual projects. The situation is that industry is more interested to go ahead with CCU projects than electricity companies. Now, for example, as I said, refineries, cement companies are going ahead with specific projects uh, which will be completed by 2025, 2026. 
In Serbia, NIS, for example, is having a project on CCUS for some time, but they're very silent about this. And I know other companies in, in Croatia that they are developing CCUS. So there is an interest, and the interest is really in the uh, industry and oil and gas sector, but not involving electricity companies, which is strange, but electricity companies are afraid of the huge cost that this may entail and the long-term commitment. Okay. I hope I have answered your question. Okay, next question. Somebody over there, yes. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for the uh, insights and the uh, very useful information presented. I will address a question to Mr. Tamaresis because uh, he very, I can say, uh, he gave us a lot of information. Uh, what are the issues? What are the problems? What are the next steps that are needed for new renewables, mostly in the in the region? And I would like to ask uh, if, by chance, you have a magic wand and you can ask for one single thing that the uh, European Union could do to align all the countries, because, as you said, all the countries should have a common goal. What would that be? In your own words, just uh, the one most important thing that could uh, contribute and help us go, go forward to this goal of 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's very easy answer. It's obviously the grid. The grid is the major obstacle in every country, at least at the eastern part of Europe. I don't know how is the situation in the western part, but definitely in every country in eastern Europe, we are sharing the same problem. Grid stability, grid, uh, a grid upgrade, new grids, uh, which eventually will lead us in a few years from now to smart grids, etc., in order to be able to utilize and uh, to control the flow of energy much better. Okay, uh, next question. Yes. First, thank you, Yene and Roek, for, uh, for this interesting. Uh, development of energy in in the region. Uh, three points. First, we are talking about the high volatility of uh, renewables. And uh, my question was to the ministry. I know that we are uh, re putting on the on the table the Tarnitz Alapusesh uh, uh, hydro storage. Are there any other batteries, for example, projects that are uh, envisaged in a potential future? Uh, this is actually going to uh, improve the safety and to diminish the volatility of potential extension of uh, wind and solar uh, parks. The second thing is uh, a matter of uh, consistent approach at the regional level. And uh, Yene has, uh, has done an incredible thing by uh, presenting what I used to call the La Russe of the energy in Eastern Europe, because it's, uh, it's a very important uh, document. And uh, I see at the table, at the panel, two of the companies that could very well uh, combine and improve the security at the regional level. We got to get out of the country level into a regional level nowadays because of, uh, uh, by the way, yesterday the European Commission has issued a, a comment on uh, the risks in environmental risk and preparation. And going at the regional level, one may uh, diminish, mitigate, and adapt to, to this type of risk. So the two companies are nuclear, and uh, and uh, photovoltaics and uh, renewables that may and um, Mr. Stambolis may may comment a little on this question. How do we act in uh, maybe near or medium future to uh, combine the capabilities of these two? And finally, uh, one question, one comment, very brief. Uh, very we. Brief have very, very brief. to define much better net zero because uh, as it is now one may uh, say hey uh, it's anthropic emissions when we breathe we exhale co2 so net zero means uh, don't breathe and we solve uh, finally because there will be no anthropics the uh, 
the emissions. Uh, that is important okay. indicators. Thank you, Thank you. The minister, please. Indeed, the energy mix, while we are going towards uh, a green, uh, green transition and uh, greener energy, is also important. Uh, this is why nuclear is very important and a priority for our country at European and uh, um, even larger uh, region level. This is why uh, hydropower is also important uh, for, for us. And this is why gas transition is also important and to, to be included in our energy mix. Um, as regards the batteries and the storage capacities, um, as I mentioned, uh, we have now a call ongoing on storage capacity, probably given the amount uh, hydro, natural hydro batteries will, will not be included there. However, the new scheme we are working now with the um, uh, DG competition and with DG Clima envisage the use, the uh, inclusion of all types of technologies that are developed now and uh, piloted and approved at European level. Uh, in addition, uh, the classical, the classical um, capacity to produce batteries uh, is also included in the call we have now ongoing on is uh, uh, around 2,200 million euro on produ uh, production of, uh, of batteries. But uh, a project as uh, Tarnica, uh, such, uh, such a large scale, this will require uh, much more assessments uh, and developments. Probably there will not be EU funds to do that, but actually the national uh, budget or maybe uh, public-private pri uh, partnerships as the legislation is now developed. Uh, and will uh, be connected actually with the national strategy for energy on which we are working now and we hope to release it for public debate in uh, less than one month. Okay, thank you. Um, I understand, Kostis, you have a question? Yes. This is addressed to Mr. Chirik, not a question, but he raised a very, very, very um, interesting in the uh, EU taxonomy issue. And you were very correct in saying that two years have already passed since uh, nuclear was included in the taxonomy, and not much has happened, OK? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, because EIB changed uh, leadership uh, early this year, uh, the, the new uh, CEO um, uh, has taken a decision to review investment on the nuclear uh, sector which has not happened since 1987. So EIB is coming into nuclear, and the directive, I understand, is to assess uh, projects uh, all over Europe about yeah, with EIB, uh, with the intention of EIB providing funds for new projects. I understand SMRs are very high on the agenda, but this does not exclude others. Uh, and of course, we'll have to wait and see if this applies also to gas, because uh, EU taxonomy included gas as well. So the other important thing is the SMR developments, as you rightly said, and, and we're very happy because Romania is the first country which is developing right now in Europe, both um, uh, uh, classic type, uh, uh, traditional type of uh, nuclear through the extension of Cerna water and upgrading and SMRs as well. And I think SMRs, in Europe, it's only, it's only Romania, the only country that is really actually having a very specific project. There's a lot of talk in other countries, UK, for example, but not, not very firm commitments, whereas Romania has a very firm commitment on SMRs. The, and the other country is, of course, USA, where SMRs are moving, uh, with the exception, of course, of Russia, which has already uh, implemented SMRs. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, what I like to add, and this also is uh, co for the, the PSD position, that is, uh, do not forget that the flexibility of the small uh, modular reactors is a factor that replacing the gas in the how to say in balancing the, the load uh, with uh, with the renewables. So that is very important uh, thing. Uh, regarding the financing, of course, that EIB is also we realize that they changed the the position. And unfortunately, uh, I hope the next step to be the revigoration of uh, Euratom fund. 
So that is practically exhausted. There are, there are just, I don't know, two, three hundred thousand million uh, euros there. So practically, they have to be. I, I negotiated a Euratom loan for Uni2, and I know what important is for the other banks to join the financing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Um, the first question is that my understanding for um, the penetration of RS is. Uh, 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 is moving higher and higher. Uh, do you think, uh, my understanding also is that we don't have enough uh, grades and storages for that. And that means that uh, we need a lot of investment. Uh, according to your uh, opinion, who is going to bear the cost for this investment? Um, countries, companies, or citizens? Sorry? To everybody, to everybody. Who wants to, to, to answer? All of you. Costis. I think the, the uh, companies obviously are taking the lead, uh, the lead role on that because uh, new projects are really initiated in most cases by companies um, and then governments follow. I think the the companies and the entrepreneurs are the real innovators in this, and therefore they set the trend. They convince governments to take policy decisions, sometimes successfully, other times unsuccessfully. But it, at the end, it's companies who initiate the, the projects and are carrying everything right to the end, with governments coming in to put the political background and directions in terms of policies. So I think it's the, it's the um, companies uh, such as uh, Terna, Eucrectica, Asprofos, uh, who are with us today, um, who are the initiators. That is very clear to me. Thank you. Okay. I said I have exactly the same opinion as Mr. Stambolis, and I would like to top up by saying that it is the European Union that makes the policies which then are uh, implemented in the countries. So I believe it's a combination of both uh, private companies as well as uh, the countries that implementing their uh, policy from the European Union. Okay, uh, my next question is regarding the EU plans. Do you think that the EU plans towards the 2050 are to the right direction or you think that uh, need to be somehow modified and to what extent? Who wants to answer? Or even from the audience? Okay, I mean, uh, let me give a very short answer. Definitely it's in the right direction because it is given from the European Union that we would like to proceed to decarbonization of the economy, which means, in few words, that we have to add more and more uh, renewables in the market. And then in order to do that, you need to find the balance and equilibrium to maintain, let's say, in an optimal level. So this means that you have to add uh, batteries, you have to add uh, other sources, for example, nuclear or uh, CCGTs, I don't know what. So in few words, it's the correct uh, direction what the EU is trying to uh, implement. The point is uh, the parameters for the fine tuning in order to make all these changes faster and more uh, effective. So, um, I think that we are lucky because it was a very good session. And uh, let's give the last applause to our panelists. Thank you, all of us. <laughs>